Good afternoon all. Uh, my name is Talha Köse. I am the director of uh, SETA Brussels. Uh, so we have an important uh, panel today. Uh, as you know, in the uh, summertime, we often uh, try to skip hot, some of the hot topics, but uh, the Cyprus diplomacy, which has been going on for decades, is one of the central uh, issues of Turkish foreign policy and at the same time, an important pillar of uh, East Med's uh, geopolitical game. So one of the game-changing events in the last couple of weeks was Turkey's and uh, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus's changing uh, negotiation frame uh, in the Cyprus issue. So the new negotiation frame has been based on the idea of sovereign uh, equality and this idea has been resisted by some of the international actors, including uh, EU, US, and United Nations. So despite all these, uh, all the earlier efforts that were based on uh, federal solutions, uh, for decades of negotiation, a uh, federal solution could not be reached. Uh, the Anand plan uh, and Gran Montana talks have failed, and the existing status quo actually affected uh, Turkey's side in the island and uh, Turkey more negatively. So this uh, new negotiation frame is important and in terms of timing uh, within the uh, East Med diplomacy, the significance of the island of Cyprus is becoming more important. So today we're going to discuss uh, the issue within a broader framework. Of course, our main issue will be the changing nature of Cyprus diplomacy, but uh, we will discuss this within the framework of broader East Met uh, diplomacy, Turkish uh, EU relations, as well as uh, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus relations uh, with Turkey. So we have three very distinguished uh, scholars uh, and researchers who have been uh, studying the issue and writing uh, and commenting on the issue for many years. Uh, so, uh, we will discuss uh, today the nature of changing Cyprus diplomacy and how it will affect Turkish foreign policy and East Met uh, geopolitical game. So, our first speaker is uh, Ahmed Sözen. Uh, he is uh, from the islands. He has been involved in several uh, conflict resolution efforts. He is a professor of international relations at Eastern Mediterranean University and founding director of Think Tank Cyprus Policy Center. He has been involved on many conflict resolution efforts. He has been involved in uh, policy initiatives, early uh, recommendations. And uh, I think his uh, comments as a scholar of conflict resolution uh, are significant. One of the key issues is that oftentimes uh, the voice of uh, Turkish Cypriots have often uh, not heard in international uh, community. So he's one of these important uh, voices which will reflect on both the Cyprus issue as well as uh, the sentiments uh, of the Turkish Cypriots in the island. So uh, welcome, Ahmed. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Tarha. Um, and I would like to start by uh, saying my thanks to the organizers, um, SETA Foundation, and specifically Professor Talia Kyose, Director of uh, uh, SETA Brussels. I think that uh, this is a very timely and relevant topic to be discussed, even though we are um, globally on a um, uh, holiday spirit. Uh, but nonetheless, mm -hmm. uh, I think uh, come September, there will be uh, more and more initiatives and more and more uh, activity rising uh, with regard to Cyprus as well as uh, Eastern Mediterranean. As the um, panel's topic suggests uh, a new era in Cyprus diplomacy with a question mark, um, we are going to focus on the change of discourse of the Turkish foreign policy regarding Cyprus um, today, um, as you know, traditional Turkish foreign policy, by and large, uh, uh, so far, focused on 
supporting uh, for so many years uh, a bi-zonal, bi-communal federation uh, in Cyprus. And recently, in the last year or so, we started seeing a change uh, from what we call BBF, bi-zonal, bi-communal federation, to a different discourse, which is basically cooperation of two sovereign equal states. Now, the question that comes to mind is, is this a radical departure, a sort of shift of axis in traditional Turkish foreign policy? Or is this a strategic move with some programmed tactics built in it for basically upping the ante, uh, sort of raising uh, Turkey sites um, um, bargaining position in the upcoming, let's say, formal negotiations. Uh, is this the second thing, which is basically um, raising the position in the pre-negotiation bargaining stage uh, to use conflict resolution um, terminology. Um, to use a famous Turkish proverb, ölümü gösterip sıtmaya razı etmek, meaning literally translated, is this a strategic move to show death and get the other side to accept <clears throat> malaria? Death, in a way, meaning two state, and malaria, meaning a bi-zonal, bi-communal federation. I think that um, it is still very early to decide whether this is a um, radical departure or whether this is a strategic move. Um, but um, given the um, future conditions that Turkey side might go back to um, the traditional, uh, let's say, um, parameters on Cyprus problem. Now, before answering that, and to me, as I said, it is still unclear, a lot depends on how Turkey's relations with, basically with its Western allies, uh, specifically United States and EU countries, will shape in the next uh, several months whether Turkey and its Western allies will find a kind of modus vivendi to kind of normalize its relations given some of the uh, problems uh, sticking out there. Uh, but first of all, let's tackle why is this change in, uh, uh, at least in the discourse of Turkish foreign policy makers. I think that um, starting from at the global level and moving towards more micro level. Starting from the global level, we have seen in the last decade or so um, a rise of populist politics in the world, um, Trump's America, the, the Brexit, uh, uh, United Kingdom are some examples. And meanwhile, on the global level, we have started witnessing a kind of um, the new power configuration. There is the relative decline of United States and relative rise of China, uh, to a lesser, lesser extent, relative rise of Russia, which created this new power balance on the global level, which have um, implications for uh, other regions in the world, including Eastern Mediterranean. So in a way, this created a new power configuration in the Eastern Mediterranean where everything is up for grabs. And what we have been witnessing in this region is the regional countries trying to become more visible, trying to exert their sovereignty, trying to exert their sphere of influence more and more in the region. So in that sense, it's not accidental, for example, when Macron uh, declared that NATO came to uh, the brain death. Um, in a way, trying to exploit the kind of void, the kind of vacuum that, for example, United Kingdom uh, resulted by, by Brexit, by leaving European Union. That's why we have seen France more and more assertive 
in the region, trying to fill that void. And in that sense, um, Turkey is also a regional power who tried to um, exert its visibility as well as its sovereignty and sphere of influence in the region. So that's one part of it. But at the same time, of course, um, there are new developments uh, in the region uh, where there was a kind of block formed in front of Turkey. Uh, due to various different reasons, which I'm not going to dwell into them now, but we can open this up during a uh, question and answer. Um, the Greek Cypriot dominated Republic of Cyprus utilized this by forging intensive cooperation agreements with Israel, with Egypt, uh, two countries, two important countries of the region, which Turkey started having some problems since 2010, um, and, and try to form this block in order to isolate Turkey in the region. And for that matter, Turkey started to sort of block any kind of fait accompli that these actors, this block, uh, might have uh, created in the region. Um, Turkey is signing this memorandum of understanding regarding uh, military cooperation and delimitation of maritime borders with the uh, UN recognized government of Libya, uh, or Turkey sending its navy to stop the Italian ENI from drilling in the waters of uh, Cyprus, which are disputed by uh, Turkey. Um, are not accidental. Uh, our, our plan of this, uh, are the steps of this plan to, to uh, avoid or to prevent any kind of uh, modus, uh, any kind of uh, feta complé that can be created by these, this block uh, against Turkey. And of course, compared to 10 something years ago, Turkish um, EU relations uh, are not the same. Uh, again, I'm not going to get into too much detail, but the kind of decisions that the EU have taken so far, uh, which uh, in a way put Turkish uh, membership negotiations into a um, de facto stop, um, and maybe there are some reasons that Turkey might uh, also have here, but um, the changing nature of Turkish EU relations also played an important role uh, in the change of discourse of Turkish foreign policy vis-a-vis -vis Cyprus. The other um, important thing now coming to the micro level to Cyprus is the position of the Greek Cypriot leadership um, first in the negotiations and the second, its policies regarding the uh, hydrocarbon issue in the Eastern Mediterranean. As you know, in 2004, for the first time in history of Cyprus negotiations, a finished comprehensive solution plan was reached, known as the Annan Plan, and this was rejected by 76% of the Greek Cypriots on the command of, let's say, the then Greek Cypriot leader, Tassos Papadopoulos. And this created a frustration as well as a disappointment in Turkish foreign policymakers as well as in the Turkish Cypriot uh, community. Now, nonetheless, the Turkish side continued supporting a bi-zonal, bi-communal federation in Cyprus that led us to the 2007, 2017, Cran Montana International Cyprus Conference, where, in my opinion, um, at the last, very last night, uh, all the parties uh, came to very close to a deal. Uh, in fact, they were so close that uh, even the nature of the plan, uh, the basic parameters of the plan uh, were tangible. And it's not secret that it was the Greek Cypriot leader Mr. Anastasiadis, who left the negotiation table that uh, led to the collapse of the Cran Montana um, Cyprus conference. 
This, in a way, increased the frustration on the Turkish side and uh, led to Turkey's side to, uh, uh, to claim that, well, if the Greek Cypriots are not um, 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 ready to share power with Turkish Cypriots, then we should look for perhaps some alternative solutions, and hence they change the, uh, the discourse. Um, and in a way, this changing of discourse is also a kind of reaction, a kind of retaliation to Greek Cypriot uh, leadership's policy uh, regarding the hydrocarbons issue in Cyprus, where the Greek Cypriot side uh, never accepts um, hydrocarbons to be part of Cyprus negotiations. They always claim that um, the Republic of Cyprus government is a sovereign uh, country and this is a matter of sovereignty, so we do not discuss this with Turkey Cypriots. And hence, um, in this new discourse, um, there are also some smaller steps like the partly opening up of the fenced area of Varosha, which was put into motion by the Turkish side which uh, in, I think in their opinion might be a game changer, it's something that might uh, force Greek Cypriots uh, back to the negotiation table. Uh, we will yet to see this. But uh, in the background of it, I think there is another reason which Turkey in a way I think tries to kill two birds with one stone with this fenced area of Varosha uh, plan. The other thing is, um, Turkey might face some court cases in the European Court of Human Rights due to Varosha. That's why in the last two, three years, I've been saying that Turkish side has to make a move on Varosha in order to prevent um, some court cases by Greek Cypriots um, uh, regarding um, uh, their properties in Varosha. Now, the next small question is, um, Is this new policy realistic? Meaning that, uh, is this something that can stick and can also entice and can attract uh, actors in international community to change their uh, perspective regarding uh, the Cyprus issue? So far, the kind of reactions that we got uh, is not really, um, um, encouraging. Um, it seems like the Security Council, uh, permanent members and EU states are not uh, there yet uh, in order to accept a two-state uh, uh, solution in Cyprus, neither the Greek Cypriot side. So I don't think that um, in the, in the, in the uh, short run or medium run, uh, this will be the basis of um, um, of the future formal negotiations. My last, let's say, two cents, uh, if I were, let's say, if I had a um, magic wand, what I would do is, my proposal is, um, uh, since starting of formal negotiations on Cyprus is not really in the horizon, meaning that the two sides do not have a common vision and a common ground to start formal negotiations. I think that this is a good time uh, to have a package deal on some sort of uh, con uh, confidence building measures. That would include, for example, the fenced area of Varosha to be opened, let's say, under UN uh, control or UN administration's uh, supervision. That, what, that will include this package, uh, some sort of direct flights to Turkish Cypriots via Erjan. Um, a lot of diplomatic novelty can be used there. Um, you, they can call it Nicosia in, International Airport uh, Terminal 2 or Terminal B. I don't know. But um, other things can be added in this. For example, a joint committee of Turkey Cypriots and Greek Cypriots to decide on the future of hydrocarbons in the Eastern Mediterranean. 
And meanwhile, Turkey opening its um, airports and seaports to Greek Cypriot vessels. I mean, this is, of course, this requires a diplomatic effort and a diplomatic campaign. But I think that um, if a package like that can be reached, um, this can play a triggering role uh, for a comprehensive solution to the Cyprus problem in the future. So I'll stop at here. I know that I left a lot of things um, unsaid, but during the uh, question and answer period, I'll be very happy to uh, give my two cents on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ahmed. So you can also, uh, our followers can ask questions on social media, so it's open and we will post some of these questions. Uh, thanks for the excellent uh, summary and more importantly, an optimistic uh, recommend, set of recommendations for confidence building measures. So there is often uh, some pessimism about uh, the people who follow Cyprus diplomacy recently, but your comments, uh, analysis, as well as your uh, recommendations, suggestions are very fruitful and constructive. So hopefully uh, all the actors who are following this issue, especially the United Nations side, may come up with a better negotiation or better mediation framework in the uh, coming days. So thank you, Ahmed. We'll come to you uh, in the Q&A section. So our uh, second speaker uh, is Mehmet Ur Ekinci. Uh, he is uh, assistant professor at uh, Turkey's uh, Police Academy. He has been writing extensively on European politics, Balkan politics, uh, and has been uh, also commenting and writing on the Cyprus issue. So uh, Mehmet Ur uh, is also uh, a researcher at SETA uh, Foundation. So. Uh, he will reflect uh, overall perspective of Turkey and uh, Turkish Cypriots within this game, how we come to this situation and why uh, there is a major change in negotiation frame. The floor is yours, Mehmet. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I thank you and uh, all the organizers for this panel. and. Uh, I'm going to speak after this uh, excellent summary by uh, Professor Ahmed Sözen. Uh, so uh, I will add to the points that he made uh, regarding global and uh, national level factors leading to today in Cyprus. Uh, first, um, I want to offer a definition, a very general definition uh, to the term solution. Uh, I mean, it's not a, a revolutionary definition, I would say solution is a fair and long-term settlement acceptable for all parties concerned. Um, up to now, uh, because of the high-level agreements between Turkey and Cypriot leaders uh, back in the late 1970s, uh, there has been an association of uh, the concept of federal solution with the term solution itself. Uh, but so far, I mean, because of, of the failures of uh, negotiations uh, for decades, now uh, a fair long-term settlement under a bizonal and bicommunal federal state doesn't seem viable for both parties and are certain diametrically opposed principles or uh, demands of both parties. Uh, which hasn't been settled in uh, all these negotiations. So this is why we came to a deadlock in 2017, and the deadlock is still continuing. The problem uh, in non-agreement uh, was that there wasn't enough incentives or pressures uh, coming, especially outside the system uh, I'm talking about from international politics or international system uh, to all parties involved in this Cyprus dispute. Uh, there were certain uh, episodes when solution, I mean, a federal solution seemed possible, uh, but in those episodes, the incentives and or pressures uh, coming to the parties were effect effective only on one side, but not to the other side. Let's look at, for example, the uh, early 2000s, when uh, the Annan plan came to the uh, agenda, and uh, Turkish Cypriots, both publicly and uh, in terms of its uh, government, 
was very much supporting, I mean, not maybe the president, but the uh, government and uh, the major of the Republic was very much supporting the package, and Turkey was also supporting the package as well. And let's remember the government uh, in Turkey, uh, the governing party in Turkey back those times uh, is the same as today. Uh, but the major uh, incentive driving both Turkey and Turkey Cypriot to the uh, federal solution was, of course, the EU membership perspective, which seemed real for Turkey as well. Uh, so not only Turkish Cypriots would become a member to become uh, EU citizens, but also Turkey would become a European uh, Union country in a short or uh, foreseeable future. Um, but during that uh, time, there wasn't enough incentives for uh, driving Greek Cypriots to a settled agreement. So that's why uh, the Greek Cypriots, the majority of Greek Cypriots said no uh, in the referendum. Uh, afterwards, uh, the incentive conditions were more or less the same. Uh, maybe in the early 2010s, when there were discoveries of hydrocarbon sources around the island, uh, maybe that could drive uh, Turkish Cypriots more towards an agreement. And uh, I attributed the uh, restart of negotiations and, I mean, maybe the acceleration of negotiations with the signing of the uh, agreement. February 2014, uh, mostly uh, to this new incentive structure, uh, because without an agreement uh, and also without Turkey's uh, involvement, uh, the use of hydrocarbon resources in Eastern Mediterranean would be uh, would not be possible uh, or would not would be very costly for uh, Greek Cypriots. Uh, but but in the 2010s, the incentive structure changed for uh, especially Turkey, uh, but also uh, connected to Turkey, the uh, Turkish Cypriots as well, because of the dependence of Cypriots to Turkey, for, uh, especially uh, from 1974 onwards. Uh, the preferences of Turkish Cypriots are also very much linked to the preferences of Turkish. Uh, so, as we all know, uh, from the mid 2000s onwards, uh, while Turkey started membership negotiations uh, with the European Union, uh, there were block, blockages coming to uh, Turkey's uh, membership negotiations. And afterwards, the financial crisis struck uh, European Union countries. And uh, in early 2010s, uh, the Arab Spring a very different security environment uh, around Turkey. Uh, so uh, new threats emerged. Uh, and geopolitics returned uh, to the geography around Turkey. This includes also Balkans as well. Uh, if you uh, look at the uh, accession process of Western Balkan countries to the European Union today, uh, you will see also very much hesitation coming from uh, EU countries, uh, very much linked to the new geopolitics uh, of today. Uh, so from early 2000s onwards, a federal solution uh, in Cyprus became less and less geopolitically meaningful for Turkey. Uh, and it, I mean, despite this, uh, Turkey continued to uh, support uh, an agreed federal solution in Cyprus uh, until the failure of negotiations in Crown Montana in summer of 2017. Uh, and this is very much uh, according to my opinion, of course, it's very much linked to the path dependency started from the early 2000s, and also the willingness of the Turkish Cypriots uh, for a solution. But uh, as Professor Ahmed Sözen mentioned, uh, the negotiations failed uh, at a point that it could really yield a solution uh, because of the uh, intransigent attitude of the Greek Cypriot leadership. Uh, but, I mean, to be frank, even if the Greek Cypriot leadership brought uh, a settlement to referendum, I wasn't really expecting uh, the Greek Cypriots to say yes to the formula which was being discussed uh, at that time. So, um, in summary, today, uh, very similar to the situation in the summer of 2017, uh, the incentive structure uh, is not sufficient to bring both sides uh, to a settled agreement. And the diametrically opposed positions uh, of Turkish and Greek Cypriots still continue, especially in the areas of power sharing, 
security arrangements and guarantees. Uh, so uh, in a near future, of course, we cannot uh, foresee uh, a, an agreed federal solution. And uh, this year, uh, Turkey and the Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus uh, for the first time officially declared that uh, they were defending a two-state solution. So uh, officially speaking, this is a paradigm change, not only a, a discourse change, I think, because change of discourse is also very much linked to political preferences. So it's not very easy to change the political preferences and the preference structure uh, of Turkey and the uh, Turkish Cypriots, maybe not the uh, president of uh, TRNC, has been the same since the failure of the negotiations. So I see it both as a rhetorical and also uh, a policy change. But uh, in fact, if we just look, uh, be, look at uh, the times before the early 2000s, when the EU membership perspective was offered to Turkey and also uh, Turkish Cypriots, uh, the non-declared position of Turkey and also the leadership of TRNC was more or less the same. Uh, so the paradigm change is in reality. Again, this is my own uh, commentary, but it is back to the old paradigm. So uh, Turkey and TRNC is still underlining sovereign equality and uh, equal international status of both communities. In the island. So uh, by looking at the discourse, um, uh, of the speeches of Turkish president and Turkish foreign minister, also declarations of Turkish foreign ministry and declarations of uh, TRNC leadership, uh, including the president and foreign minister. Uh, we see that uh, negotiations is still welcome, uh, but only under these two principles. So uh, I recently published an opinion piece at SETA in Turkish. Uh, so there I discussed that in addition to a two-state solution, uh, confederal uh, alternatives can also come to table as long as both sides, Turkish and Greek Cypriots, agree to uh, this formula. Uh, my opinion is viability is very important. So whatever solution uh, to be agreed, it, should be, it shouldn't be uh, agreed upon uh, as a response to the international conjunctures or pressures but the long-term uh, consequences should be borne in mind. And um, a federal solution, uh, because of the changing international power configurations and preferences uh, of uh, countries in Eastern Mediterranean, wouldn't be viable even if it was agreed in 2017. Now, a federation can be an alternative, but the viability is very questionable because the two communities have been living separately in the island for such a long time, for decades. Uh, they don't know each other's languages well uh, and establishing uh, a common state policy in macro like macroeconomics and foreign policy uh, would be very difficult, uh, especially if the uncertainties in international system continues uh, a bit more. So, uh, now, I am ex expecting both TRNC and Turkey to continue its uh, two-state solution rhetoric and uh, preference uh, for an indeterminate time, at least uh, there are until there are sig significant changes in international power balances. Uh, today, it is a fact that uh, internationally, two-state solution will not be uh, regarded positively by, uh, first of all, the permanent members to the uh, Security Council uh, and European Union as well. But these scenarios have been discussed internationally uh, for quite a long time. For example, I remember uh, shortly after the signing of the agreement between two presidents in Cyprus in 2014, a crisis group published a report about an alternative solution uh, which they proposed as two uh, independent states under the European Union. So in terms of also cost and uh, benefit uh, calculations, economic calculations, uh, this can be uh, the most practical solution perhaps, but of course, the two sides, first of all, have to agree on this. And uh, I'm not foreseeing in the, in the visible future that the Greek Cypriots would 
uh, agree in, in, in whatever way the, on, on the two-state solution. So uh, the viability of this uh, discourse, as questioned by the Professor Sozen, uh, uh, could be questioned uh, also how, how long Turkey will uh, continue this discourse and how long the Turkish Cypriots will continue this. But it is very clear that under current circumstances, the Greek Cypriots uh, are unwilling to uh, yield political power. Uh, power. Uh, so since they are uh, accepted internationally as the only legitimate government of Cyprus. So uh, given these circumstances, uh, any discussion for a federal solution would only delay a fair and long-term settlement acceptable for all parties, which is the definition that I offered in the beginning of my uh, intervention. So uh, this is why I'm expecting both TRNC and Turkey to keep uh, this position for long. And uh, it remains to be seen whether international actors uh, will agree on alternative ways uh, of uh, engagements with Turkish Cypriots. I am also, I mean, to be realistic, I am not expecting any uh, serious international recognition of TRNC in a foreseeable future, but uh, there could be uh, economic engagements and other sort of maybe proxy uh, engagements with uh, Turkish Cypriots, which can relieve uh, the pressures upon uh, the Turkish community in Thailand. So these are the points that I wanted to make. If there are questions, uh, I will be happy to answer them. Thank you very much, Mehmet uh, Vur. So, uh, I mean, as you mentioned, uh, although there's a new negotiation paradigm, it is not new for Turkey and Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. And uh, it seems that international community, as well as uh, the Greek side and Greek Cypriots, are not willing to yield to, the, to these positions. So what it means that uh, I think this uh, new position is also related to contextual transformations and uh, some of the key geopolitical uh, transformations. So, uh, however, you also mentioned uh, possible interim solutions based on uh, confederal uh, option, and you also suggested some uh, concrete uh, options uh, for uh, that may uh, fell within this framework. So thank you for this uh, presentation uh, and uh, this general uh, perspective. I think it reflects some of the key uh, concerns of the uh, Turkish and Turkish uh, Republic of Northern Cyprus. So now we have uh, the third uh, speaker, uh, Kvanç Ulusoy. So is he available? Uh, I think there was some technical problem, but uh, can we reach uh, Kvanç or should we uh, wait for his presence and continue? Kvanç is tekrar bağlanamadı. Okay, so uh, I think there is some technical problem in our third speaker, uh, Kvanç Ulusoy. So we will try to reach him and we will try to connect him. Uh, but uh, I think we still have uh, some questions and uh, comments uh, until we get connected to uh, Kvanç. So, uh, Amit, I would like to uh, start with uh, you. Especially, uh, there is still a lot of uh, thought and, you know, comment on the Anand plan. So, and uh, still, uh, I know that from both Turkey and from, uh, you know, Cyprus, uh, Turkish side, uh, some actors are uh, in support for the idea of the Anand plan and the idea behind this. So what do you think? I mean, is it completed that uh, after, uh, or is it a significant uh, negotiation framework uh, that may be alternative to current framework? What do you think about this uh, Anand plan? And what are the sentiments of uh, Turks in the islands? Um, thank you, Tara. I think this is an excellent question, and um, 
let me reflect a little bit about the um, research that I have been engaged with in the last 10 something years on both sides of the island. We have, myself and some Greek Cypriot uh, researchers, we have conducted several um, public opinion polls on both sides of the island since 2009-2010. And there, in these uh, um, public opinion polls, we also tested alternative solution models to uh, Cyprus problem. Um, the alternatives, uh, of course, starting with the BBF, Bizonal Bicommunal Federation. The other alternatives were something like a unitary state without any communal rights, one person, one vote, uh, was another alternative. Then two state solution or a confederation of two independent states. And finally, um, the continuation of the status quo. Um, as well as we also tested integration of North Cyprus to Turkey, what I called several years ago in, a, um, in an article I wrote, Hattaization of North Cyprus. And um, it's, um, it's fascinating in the last 10 years, the result of the um, alternative solutions came very steadily not much changing in the, um, in the um, results. The first preference of Turkish Cypriots came very consistently as that they prefer two-state solution as their first option. A bizonal bicommunal federation is their second preference. For Greek Cypriots, their first preference, without surprise, is a unitary state to solve Cyprus problem. And a bizonal bicommunal federation comes as their second preference. But when we look at the results of all these, whether we like it or not, the only alternative solution model that has the chance to pass from simultaneous referendums of two sides is a bizonal bicommunal federation. The other options, the other alternatives, for example, a unitary state would never pass in the Turkish Cypriot side, or two-state solution will never be, at least in the foreseeable future, will no, not be accepted by Greek Cypriot population. So given this, we have this hard reality on the ground uh, that um, the only option that has the chance ranging from highly desirable to desirable to satisfactory to tolerable if necessary to undesirable on that sort of uh, scale. Um, the only uh, option that has the chance to pass from both sides is, as I said, whether we like it or not, is a bizonal bicommunal federation, which is the second preference for both sides. And in conflict resolution, this makes sense because if you want to reach a solution to a conflict, especially uh, a protracted conflict like Cyprus, then, you know, um, the solution is not going to make each side 100% happy and 100% satisfied. Look, um, about... Um, 25 years ago, when I was writing my PhD thesis on Cyprus negotiations, I, I did um, uh, several uh, dozens of uh, interviews. One of that was with the UN Secretary General Spe Special Advisor to Cyprus, Mr. Gustav Faisal, where I asked him what would be the ideal solution to the Cyprus problem, and he said, a federation. And I said, why? Well, he says because it is the second option or second preference for both Greek Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. It's the only solution that requires mutual compromise, a solution that will not make each side 100% happy, that might leave each side slightly unhappy, but at least each side will get 
I don't know, 75 or 80% of what they are demand as a solution. So there is that hard reality also uh, uh, in front of us. So uh, there will be people, and there are people still uh, in Cyprus uh, who support a federal solution on both sides. And very interestingly, compared to several years ago, um, the number of Greek Cypriots, the percentage of Greek Cypriots who are moving towards this acceptability of a federal solution is increasing gradually. So in a way, the, the non-solution of the Cyprus problem and maybe some of the steps that Turkey has, uh, the Turkey side has taken so far is also playing an important role in motivating or encouraging uh, Greek Cypriots towards more to a uh, bi-zonal, bi-communal federation. As, as, as to the two-state solution, it mm -hmm. has some several um, problems. Problems uh, related to international treaties. For example, the Treaty of Establishment or the Treaty of Guarantee, which created in 1960 the Republic of Cyprus. They prohibit um, creation of another state in Cyprus. There are UN Security Council resolutions um, prohibiting that. And um, even, even if, let's say, there is a miracle and Greek Cypriots uh, accept that, there is this huge issue of property that needs to be resolved, even in two-state solution, because the property that the TRNC sits on, part of it, a, a large part of it, belongs to uh, private Greek Cypriot uh, owners. So there is a huge um, um, problem there. Once I said again many years ago, if the Turkey side wants to reach at the end, finally, to a two-state solution, it passes from establishing a federation. And if you want, I can explain that briefly. Because the international community or the majority or the big actors in international community are not, are not ready to accept that uh, for various different reasons, um, the only possibility that in the future there will be two states in Cyprus is first to establish a federal solution, which will solve also all the sticking property disputes. And at some point, if that federation is not functional, then maybe the two sides, just like the Czechs and the Slovaks have decided peacefully, they might come to an understanding that, um, sorry guys, this is not really working smoothly. And since we solved the property issue, uh, we, want, we want out. In that sense, maybe then um, um, a two-state solution can be reached in Cyprus. But I think the way to go there is not directly, especially given the current international conjecture, but I think it also passes from establishing a federal uh, solution in Cyprus. That's my two cents on it. That's a very interesting comment, uh, really. Uh, I mean, we didn't hear such a comment uh, frequently, but, uh, you know, how ready is uh, the Greek Cypriot uh, site uh, to start some kind of, uh, I mean, uh, we know that the leadership is concerned about changing the status quo. Do they feel that if they change the status quo and if they uh, reduce the isolations, uh, they will lose their advantages in negotiations? I mean, at what, I mean, uh, one of the key issues for the problems of the uh, continuing stalemate is the isolation of uh, Turkish side in the island, and this is really mm -hmm. uh, painful. Yeah. So, to what extent do you see a chance for? reducing these isolations or finding a common uh, you know, ground for opening new channels of negotiation uh, by reducing the isolations? 
What do you think? I mean, I, I think in, in these uh, uh, kind of times when, uh, and we have uh, witnessed this uh, so many times in the past when we haven't seen meaningful negotiations taking place for two, three, four years. From 1997 to 2000, for example, almost three years, there was no meaningful negotiations. From 2004 to 2008, for four years, there was no um, formal negotiation. I think that these times needs to be utilized, you know, in, instead of wasting them without anything. That's why I propose in my intervention a package deal on some sort of confidence building measures because I believe in the value of confidence building measures, because they are by themselves will mellow down the tension on the island, and they will also bridge this big gap of trust between the two sides. And of also the kind of confidence building measures that can change positively the quality of life of average Turkish and Greek Cypriots will also increase the cooperation um, um, experience as well as cooperation culture in Cyprus, which has been by and large missing since the 1960s, since the constitutional crisis and the, um, um, that resulted in at least uh, uh, withdrawal and expulsion of Turkish Cypriots from the Republic of Cyprus. So that's why I see the value of um, these packages that can, for example, include, as I said, the opening up of the fenced area of Varosha and some sort of direct flights for Turkish Cypriots, which will ease part of their um, isolation. And the opening up of uh, Varosha can create also thousands of new jobs. And if you look at the proximity, the Famagusta port under Turkish uh, uh, Cypriot administration is only a um, um, half kilometer away. So, you know, think about building of Varosha, rebuilding of Varosha, you need all these um, materials, construction materials and whatnot. It, where will they come? Um, so it will have very positive effects. And a lot of people think that if we focus on confidence building measures and we ease isolations of Turkish Cypriots, then forget about a comprehensive solution to the Cyprus problem. It will make the division much more concrete. I think on the contrary, just the opposite. I think that the more cooperation the two sides can engage in, I think that there will be a positive spillover effect that will necessitate more cooperation. And just like the coal and steel community uh, that started in Europe that led finally to the European Union uh, with, of course, some other steps in between, um, European Economic Community and then European uh, 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 Union. Um, this can trigger, this can play a positive role in, um, in, in uh, triggering a comprehensive solution to the Cyprus problem. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, uh, Ahmed. Uh, I will have a, a question to uh, Mehmet Urekinci uh, as well. Uh, so, Mehmet Ur, you mentioned uh, some alternative uh, approach. Definitely one of the key obstacles to those alternatives is the stance of European Union. So, and one significant issue uh, that's a uh, frustration, uh, you know, that's frustrating is EU's relations with Turkey. So uh, what do you think, I mean, to what extent Turkish-EU relations is connected with this issue? Do you think improvement in the Turkish-EU relations may facilitate some new ideas on this issue? Or, I mean, do you think some alternative actors should play a role in this game? What, what do you think on this? Uh, can you unmute? unmute? Uh, excuse me, yeah. Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, it's a very difficult uh, thing to disentangle the Cyprus issue and uh, Turkey-EU relations. I mean, they are so much entangled, so it makes the 
commentary about which affects the other the most uh, is very difficult mm -hmm. because if you remember the year 2005 when Turkey started uh, membership negotiations or after shortly after the uh, start of negotiations, uh, it was the Cyprus dispute which uh, stopped uh, Turkey's negotiations, especially in certain chapters. And uh, it was a very big stumbling block uh, on Turkey's negotiations, which uh, so Turkey Cyprus issue definitely affected Turkey's uh, membership process uh, negatively. But afterwards, uh, due to the return of geopolitics, this time Turkey's relations with Brussels affects, affected Turkey's preferences in Cyprus. And I think this is much more salient today. So, uh, I mean, I, I don't think any... Uh, observer would uh, find Turkey's EU membership a real perspective or some possibility in a foreseeable future. If there is no uh, such a prospect, then Turkey, of course, uh, will have reservations about a, a federal Cyprus under the European Union. Uh, European Union. Of course, that will bring benefits to Turkey's Cypriots economically. Uh, but geopolitics, if it's becoming an important uh, rule of the game in international politics now, uh, this is definitely a factor uh, in Turkey's calculations. Uh, it's, it might uh, be a good question to look uh, why Turkey still uh, supported uh, the federal solution up until the mid-2000s. Uh, I think it's a very uh, strong gesture of goodwill for a settlement in Cyprus. But the Greek Cypriots uh, missed that chance. Now, as an observer, uh, I'm not really uh, expecting uh, any uh, any development in Turkey-EU relations, any positive development in Turkey-EU relations to affect uh, Turkey's calculations regarding a federal solution uh, in Cyprus, uh, unless, of course, it brings a, a real membership uh, perspective to Turkey. Uh, so uh, Turkey-EU relations... I don't think will affect Turkey's uh, either rhetoric or policy preferences in Cyprus. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, issue question comes to my mind. Of course, uh, the move in Russia is a significant uh, game-changing event. Uh, do you expect any further game-changing moves from Turkey's sides, from both, uh, you know, positive or negative in terms of, you know, the changing the nature of negotiations? I mean. Is there a, a set of uh, plans, or is it just uh, you know just a signal uh, for changing the existing stalemate? Actually, the status quo uh, has been as such for uh, for decades. So Turkey has been supporting uh, the independence of uh, Turkish Cypriots. Uh, so there is no change actually in the game from Turkey's perspective. I think uh, now the Cyprus problem is the problem of, or more the problem of uh, the Greeks, Greek Cypriots and the European Union uh, and the Western actors now, uh, because uh, it, it will be very difficult to, uh, to sustain the status quo, especially if Turkey makes new moves in, in the north of Cyprus, or if other countries inc increases its engagements in, in North Cyprus or starts new uh, new engagements, that it will be very difficult for the European Union to sustain uh, this divided situation in the island. I mean, at least on paper, let's think about this. I mean, there is no other such an example uh, in the European Union. Uh, so, um, yes, uh, the move in Varosha, I read it uh, as, first of all, uh, a support to the sovereignty of uh, Turkish Republic of Northern Cyprus. So Turkey is supporting the move uh, by saying that the Tur uh, Turkish Republic of Na Northern Cyprus can take critical decisions uh, in Varosha, which is which the uh, Turkish Republic of Northern, Northern Cyprus sees as their own territory. Uh, first of all, this is a message uh, supporting the uh, sovereignty and independence of Turkish Cypriots. And secondly, it is a kind of an attempted pressure uh, to the Greek Cypriots uh, to uh, loosen their positions uh, in the negotiations. Uh, so far, yes, there are some uh, property owners, as far as I see from the media, property owners from the South uh, willing to uh, take their uh, properties back. But 
Uh, we will see how much pressure it will create. I mean, so far, uh, politically speaking, uh, the pressure is so low because in international scenery also there are some, uh, I mean, quite a few countries and actors uh, supporting the Greek position regarding Varosha. Uh, but of course, if the status quo continues, uh, the Greek Cypriot side uh, would be more uh, uneasy about the uh, consolidation of the status quo and uh, the building of uh, a, a federal solution. So uh, this can really uh, change the game, but uh, in the middle uh, term, I think, I mean, in the short run, I'm expecting both the Greek uh, Cypriot government and also Greece uh, to continue their uh, doing their lobby activities uh, in the EU and uh, in the United States and in other countries in the world, especially in Security Council member countries. Uh, to the position. Uh, I think if the United Kingdom uh, was more involved uh, in, in Cyprus uh, dispute as a mediator or facilitator, uh, that could have also uh, brought new alternative solutions to the table uh, because now the Euro United Kingdom, as we know, is out of the uh, European Union and uh, the British are always pragmatic uh, to, uh, to take into account different perspectives uh, to bring out the solution. Uh, we are not seeing that forthcoming. So uh, the status quo will likely to continue, but as it continues, uh, the Greek Cypriots uh, will uh, need to find uh, new approaches or maybe uh, some flexibility in their approach. So we'll be uh, following this closely, so what will be their next uh, response? Thank you. So I think we have connected to our third speaker, Kvan so He had some technical difficulties, but we are glad to have you uh, here, uh, Kvan. So Kvan Kudusoy is a professor of political science at Istanbul University. So he was previously a Fulbright Fellow at Harvard Kennedy School and John Money Fellow at uh, Robert Schumann Center. Uh, and he has been extensively published on Cyprus issue, Turkish-EU relations, identity issues in Turkey. So he will reflect more about uh, the changing geo geopolitical game in the East Med and how it reflected and how it changed uh, the current uh, debates and current discussions with regard to Cyprus issue. So the broader uh, geopolitical context of the Cyprus, uh, you know, the, the change in the Cyprus issue. The floor is yours. Thanks so uh, much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Talhat. Uh, sorry for this uh, internet failure. I, I'm not, uh, it's not my responsibility, actually, but I live sometimes in this house, uh, these kind of problems. Uh, sorry for this. Uh, and um, thank you for the invitation. I find, uh, as Professor Sozen mentioned, uh, this, uh, con this convention, uh, this meeting, uh, quite timely and relevant. Uh, I'm, I'm sure we will... Uh, uh, the, the Cyprus conflict and the problems in the Eastern Mediterranean will occupy our agenda in the coming months and uh, years uh, more and more uh, as uh, the stakeholders of uh, the energy discoveries and uh, the peace uh, and the conflict in this region uh, are uh, quite uh, alive and <laughs> Uh, and well, uh, so I will uh, divide uh, my uh, my presentation into two sections. In fact, uh, first uh, section will relate uh, to um, uh, the, uh, the internal dynamics of the EU decision making, which uh, prevents uh, the improvement of the relations between Turkey and the EU and uh, and, uh, and and the comprehensive solution in Cyprus uh, the second section will uh, will relate to or relates to uh, the, the the broader geopolitics of the eastern mediterranean which becomes uh, i think uh, uh, which gains uh, better uh, which gains uh, a new dimension with the abrahamic accords uh, that israel uh, signed with the 
uh, Gulf countries uh, and now, uh, today probably, with Morocco. Uh, so uh, Israel extends uh, uh, its, uh, uh, its, uh, its embeddedness in, in the Middle East uh, uh, more than ever uh, over the past uh, two years. So the Cyprus question is related with this too. Uh, first of all, uh, um, let me uh, come to the first section. I'm, I'm thinking, uh, basically, I'm not going into further details uh, of all these uh, developments since the incorporation, since the membership of Cyprus Republic or or Greek Cypriot uh, to uh, to the EU uh, that uh, that the EU decision making, which uh, once uh, uh, its scholar of integration Fritz Sharp mentioned a joint decision trap, uh, prevents uh, the uh, the the deepening of uh, the relations between Turkey and the EU, and also the resolution of the Cyprus conflict. What could Turkey do? Uh, Turkey actually, uh, you know, supported the Annan plan, uh, which was uh, approved by the uh, great majority of of the Turkish Cypriots. Uh, later, uh, the, you know, uh, Greek Cypriot uh, President uh, Mehmet Ali Talat uh, made great efforts uh, to negotiate with. Uh, uh, to negotiate a solution with uh, Dimitri Seristovias of Akel uh, of, uh, uh, of the South. Uh, and later, uh, the Greek uh, Turkish Cypriots acted uh, probably one of the most moderate uh, uh, politicians in the island, uh, Mustafa Akinci, as a president. And he made a lot of efforts to improve the relations with the Greek Cypriots, both uh, the people and, 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 the, and the country. Uh, so uh, I would ask myself, what would Turkey, Turkish Cypriots, uh, do <laughs> more uh, to improve uh, its relations with with, um, uh, with Greek Cypriots uh, as a as a country uh, and as a people? What would Turkey do uh, to uh, I would say uh, to contribute more? or uh, any more uh, to the resolution of the Cyprus conflict. Because as you might know, uh, up to 2011, uh, when you look at the European Union reports, uh, you see almost an identical sentences with, uh, in uh, uh, saying that uh, Turkey, uh, uh, Turkish foreign policy and EU neighbor pol neighborhood policy is in line with each other or is in correspondence with each other, something like this. So you see, until 2011, Turkey and, uh, and uh, Turkish foreign policy and, and European Union foreign policy actually were in line with that. And in this context, they were in line with uh, improving uh, the relations of the communities on the island and improving uh, the possibility of solution uh, for both communities in the island. So. Uh, and I see uh, signs of change, and everyone probably uh, saw it from 2000 onwards uh, with a blunt declaration of uh, President Erdogan, then the Prime Minister, uh, that uh, there is no, <laughs> uh, there is no, uh, what, 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 what was the uh, sentence? There, uh, there are two states in the island, as, uh, he said, uh, in 2012, when he visited the island, he said, uh, there is no, uh, he said, uh, he said, a, a, a dramatic return, uh, in a dramatic return to, to the traditional Turkish foreign policy, rejecting uh, the federal solution and mentioning that there is th there are two states uh, uh, in the region, uh, in, in, on the island, and, uh, and that's it. Uh, I, I found the, uh, I found the, I found the statement by Erdogan, he says, there is no state called Cyprus. Uh, for us, uh, there is a Greek Cyprus site and, and the TRNC it's on 20 July 2012. He said this, and this was, uh, uh, since then, of course, Turkey's uh, foreign policy uh, made a dramatic shift backwards and, or backslided openly uh, to its traditional position of defending a two-state solution there. Uh, so, um, and, uh, you know, uh, 
this was, of course, an unexpected move, but for uh, people, uh, for 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 uh, for close observers of the of the let's say of the of the Cyprus conflict, it's not a surprising thing, because uh, Turkey did a lot uh, and uh, probably uh, uh, arrived uh, to uh, to the. Uh, to the uh, to the level of cons concessions that uh, uh, that that it can give uh, with, uh, with uh, in all these times, and I I, I remember there was another uh, Erdogan statement uh, saying again that there is no concession in Cyprus, uh, no concessions in Cyprus, something like this. In all these. Uh, of course, hard statements comes with a, a moral point of view in the case of Turkey. Turkey simply defended uh, that uh, that European Union, uh, which was which was having a great difficulty to issuing, uh, let's say, uh, uh, the financial protocols or to implementing financial protocols after the failure of the Annan plan was expected to open, let's say, the isolation uh, or bring an end to the isolation of the Turkish Cypriots. Uh, it was uh, the case in 2004, it was the case in 2012, and it was the case in 2019 when uh, Turkey and Turkish Cypriots defended an argument uh, that, uh, that when, um, that, that, that there should be a joint committee uh, to um, to divide the, uh, the the revenue of uh, of the hydro hydrocarbons for two communities, but it was again rejected by the Greek Cypriots, saying that no, we uh, own the uh, uh, we do the business and we give you the share of it. So they rejected any kind of joint effort, any kind of effort or uh, or a political, uh, I would say, uh, uh, political, I would say, uh, political uh, uh, statement that would include, that would give an identity, a proper status to the Turkish cities. Of course, this makes uh, uh, everything uh, very difficult uh, for. Uh, this makes everything very difficult for uh, Turkey and Turkish cities, to my side, uh, make any favorable move uh, for uh, uh, for betterment of situation in the island, on the island. Anyway, this is uh, the, the first section. The second section relates to the overall geopolitical change in uh, in the region, which is related. Uh, to, uh, which is which is relating to the Cyprus conflict, uh, and uh, you see uh, Erdogan's statements ac actually corresponds with the uh, spring when uh, Turkey, uh, you know, had a kind of uh, strong voice in the region, especially in the Eastern Mediterranean, and uh, uh, with a uh, you know with a regional power status, trying to promote democracy in the region. So this was. Um, the uh, motto of those times, democracy promotion, like uh, the EU and the Americans promote democracy in elsewhere. Uh, so this democracy promotion uh, actually uh, provided uh, an important uh, upper hand for Turkey in the region, and uh, Turkey was uh, quite popular, strong, and uh, and in this context, uh, Turkey had, uh, I would say, diverging interest. Uh, uh, with the EU uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. So the EU's uh, position and Turkey's position towards the uh, towards the democratizing date dynamics in the, uh, in the Arab world were, were different. And Turkey also clashed with Israel in, uh, in, in, this, uh, in, this, in this regard. Uh, and uh, the things, uh, of course, the general geopolitical situation deteriorated with that. So Turkey, uh, <laughs> with the Arab Spring, found uh, not an enemy, but at least an adversary, uh, a, a series of adversaries uh, in the region. Israel, European Union, 
uh, and uh, and uh, the other uh, regional powers like Egypt, uh, which uh, does not want to democratize, which prevents democracy the, the, uh, through a coup d'état. Uh, so the so the, the, the Turkish, uh, I would say, penetration towards the Middle East uh, was somehow uh, prevented uh, uh, in this regard. Uh, and uh, this provided uh, a vacuum for Israel and for Greece and for Cyprus to uh, get into a deeper relationship. You know, they have been already deepening their relationship with exclusive economic zone agreements from 2007 onwards. But, uh, the, but this political vacuum that uh, actually Turkey left in the Eastern Mediterranean provided... Um, uh, those countries uh, with an incentive and a power to, let's say, uh, to bring their uh, uh, their uh, high health or uh, conflicting interests uh, in line with each other. And this, uh, of course, uh, I think the, uh, the distinguishing uh, side of this geopolitical change is the deepening of Israel's, uh, I, I would say, power in the, in the region. Israel is more and more embedded in the region uh, now and Turkey found itself a bit isolated from uh, the game in, uh, in, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Uh, and uh, of course this uh, made uh, the resolution of the Cyprus uh, conflict uh, a bit difficult. Uh, a bit difficult in the sense that Cyprus, a very small island, a country, uh, found uh, itself uh, uh, more powerful uh, than it expected. Uh, uh, because uh, uh, Cy uh, Cyprus, uh, Greek Cypriots, uh, backed by the European Union uh, and uh, backed by Israel and Greece uh, individually, uh, found no reason to compromise neither on the island with Turkish Cypriots with Turkey. Uh, and the situation is complete paralysis. Uh, I will say uh, that, uh, that this, this, uh, this zero-sum game of power would, would, would never, uh, I would say, uh, would, uh, would never help anyone. Um, it would not, uh, I mean, at the moment Turkey uh, seems uh, a loser. Uh, I, I mean, at least in terms of appearance, it's, it looks like that. But everyone knows that the, the, the surest and the shortest way of uh, the uh, common richness of the region, uh, which is hydrocarbon reserves, from Israel, from Egypt, and from, uh, from Cyprus, is via Turkey. Uh, the, uh, and uh, there is no uh, feasible option of carrying those hydrocarbons, oil and gas, from the eastern Mediterranean to uh, to Europe via, uh, via uh, pipelines undersea. Uh, I, th I think a reasonable European uh, in, uh, investors uh, and, uh, and reasonable, uh, I would say, uh, oil companies will not resort to that risky game. Uh, so uh, that, that zero-sum game uh, uh, that is created, uh, let's say, in the aftermath of the Arab Spring in the Eastern Mediterranean would help no one. And I would uh, argue that uh, the idea of uh, dividing uh, the land in the, in the Middle East and the Eastern Mediterranean broad walls Dividing the sea will bring more wars, not less. So the exclusive econ economic zone negotiations uh, 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 would uh, would go nowhere. Uh, I would uh, ask uh, uh, everyone uh, to return to the idea of Mare Nostrum. This is uh, everyone's sea, and the uh, the richness of that sea is of of everyone, and I should help everyone. Uh, and I would uh, really uh, like to conclude here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kovanc. So your concluding remark is also uh, very important. Uh, so unfortunately, uh, we occasionally, uh, the actors occasionally lose this uh, sense of 
shared destiny and shared interests. Uh, so my question is, you mentioned some of the structural transformations in the region, especially uh, the Abraham uh, Accords. So, and also uh, in connection with the Arab Spring, what do you think, I mean, to what extent Arab Spring is critical in shaping of the Cyprus issue, or do you think the uh, EU-Turkey relations is more definitive in terms of uh, change of the mindset? I mean, uh, yes, I mean, definitely in terms of structural uh, transformation, Arab Spring was, uh, you know, a significant game changer, but how, how do you think it uh, triggered, uh, you know, especially the Greek Cypriot side's uh, policy change with regard to the islands? Uh, you know, Arab Spring, uh, you know, for the Arabs, uh, had a different spring, uh, had, had a different significance. Uh, at least in terms of appearance, you did not see any radical change in the, in the geopolitics. So everyone's border looks uh, before, uh, uh, after the Arab Spring too, uh, meaning that there is no border change, there is no major uh, geopolitical game change. But uh, you see in reality and uh, that uh, that uh, Syria is de facto divided, uh, and, uh, and and many uh, authoritarian regimes in the region uh, was directly challenged, and uh, so this uh, I would uh, take uh, the Arab Spring as an important uh, a bold step in the Arab countries' democratization. For the time being, democracy promotion idea uh, uh, simply bank, uh, uh, bankrupted. I mean, it was in, is in bankruptcy now. It's not easy to speak democracy in the region now uh, and elsewhere. Uh, I would say. Uh, however, uh, the, the implications of the uh, of the Arab Spring on uh, uh, on uh, on the Cyprus conflict is kind of indirect. First of all, uh, initially there was a fear that the migration uh, challenge uh, would affect uh, the, uh, Cyprus too. But as far as I see, uh, the, this did not uh, create a, uh, this created a fear uh, in the island. But and this did not make a uh, make a, a very serious uh, threat. Uh, to, uh, to at least social cohesion in, in the island, uh, which is divided. Uh, but um, I would see that the, the, the Arab Spring, uh, after more than a 10 years, after almost 10 years, I would say, uh, that the Arab Spring would I I increase the, the regional power of Israel. Uh, and, and, and the Israeli foreign policy idea of, uh, let's say, uh, being more embedded in the Middle East and more in the pa Palestinian issue. So, uh, I mean, we are now less and less speaking about the Palestinian issue. We are more and more speaking about the deepening of the relations between uh, Israel and uh, major Arab countries. And those Arab countries are Sunni, by the way. Uh, and this is an important uh, detail. And of course, this uh, multiplies Israel's power and negotiation in the region in, in every aspect. Uh, and that uh, makes easier uh, to, to, to go into deal, uh, a trans, trans regional deals uh, from Gulf to, uh, to Eastern Mediterranean to, let's say, to Europe. And these are not fantasies anymore. Uh, given the level of technology uh, and know how, uh, these are reasonable, rational, at least, I mean, these are, these are beyond uh, discussion, but these are not fantasies. And, and Israel turns to be a very serious uh, bridge in the region. Uh, not uh, only in terms of political brokerage, but also in terms of, let's say, uh, infrastructure development and, you know, energy deals, etc., etc. And this helped uh, Egypt 
to be uh, also a very serious player in the Gaz game. Uh, and uh, Israel, Egypt, and, and and the European Union, because you know, I, I uh, sorry, I forgot to mention this: uh, the the inclusion of Cyprus uh, to the e, uh, to the EU actually brought the EU de facto in the Eastern Mediterranean. EU is a player in the Eastern Mediterranean. It was no more before 2004. So EU is uh, is one of the players. Yes, uh, the, the rest are state, uh, and the EU is, is a is a is an interstate uh, sui generis organization. But the EU is also a player. So so you see an, a, a change of the platform of discussions, and of course this affects uh, very much uh, the uh, the the probable uh, let's say infrastructure um, uh, projects and uh, and. Peace negotiations and uh, and and pro and other things. Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Klein. So uh, I think we come to the end of the debate, but I'm going to ask a question to both Mehmet Urek and Jan Ahmed Susan. So, uh, as some analysts argue that the East Med uh, pipeline project is impractical uh, after EU's uh, you know environmental policies and efforts. reduce uh, carbon production. So, of course, this is an important game changer uh, in the entire region and especially with regard to the Cyprus issue. So what do you think, I mean, what may be uh, the impact of uh, this uh, new argument? I mean, do you think this may change uh, the facilitate uh, reaching a deal in Cyprus issue or a broader uh, regional uh, agreement or do you think this will just, uh, you know, uh, keep, uh, I mean, this will be a limited uh, issue uh, in the scope of broader uh, East Med geopolitics. So, Amit, I would like to start with you. What, what, is, what is your comment on this? Look, I, the, the short answer is that um, the um, Eastern Mediterranean pipeline is a pipe dream. As a good friend of mine, uh, Charles Edinas, once put it, I, I think that um, uh, on an overall thing, I'm not an energy um, uh, expert. I don't, I'm not so uh, in command of uh, technical details, but let me put it this way. I, I've, I've read a report from USA Geological um, Association, which, um, which did this seismic study back in 2010, and they renewed it uh, this year, 2021. And they actually decrease the expected um, amount of uh, hydrocarbons um, in the region. Now, yes, they, we might be sitting on some um, hydrocarbon um, resources, but given the trends, global trends, in terms of the prices of uh, uh, hydrocarbons, given the abundance of the shale gas, which the Americans started to pump into world markets, and given the fact that the EU, which uh, Kuwant rightly put it, that they are also an actor in Eastern Mediterranean in the last 15-something um, uh, uh, years, um, that they are moving towards more to renewable energy, and they have been actually putting some hard targets for 2030 and 2050. Um, these are not good news for um, natural gas owners or, or countries who will be sitting on natural gas. The prices um, uh, will not tend to go up. So we might be, as I said, sitting on some natural gas uh, resources, but we will probably be not able to dig them out because they might not be commercially feasible. So in that sense, what is happening in the Eastern Mediterranean from the very start, I've been saying that it is not primarily related to energy struggles or energy wars, but more what I said at the beginning of my intervention today that this is more of a geopolitical 
game uh, which is based on these new power shifts, these new power configurations, I like to call them, um, uh, where the regional countries, littoral states, coastal states are trying to exert their sovereignty and try to exert their sphere of influence um, in the region. Um, given all these, I think what needs to be done is to change the discourse in the um, in this, this in, in in tackling with the energy issue rather than um, focusing on the security and geopolitical aspects. Maybe an alternative is to focus on the environmental aspects of the energy issue of how to keep our seas um, safe, environmentally uh, safe, and maybe we can start a kind of cooperation from there. Mm -hmm. um, I would suggest um, that instead of each country dealing with its own gas, let's say, um, if we can find a way to combine the gas, let's say the Egyptian, the Cypriot, hopefully with a united island or a island with, with a solution and Turkish gas, Israeli gas, and maybe turning it into, I don't know, electricity and, and connecting the electricity grids of the coastal states might be the way to go uh, to create a much more environmentally friendly Mediterranean, Eastern Mediterranean basin, uh, rather than, um, you know, um, keeping this, let's say, sovereignty wars, uh, which is basically not helping anybody. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you. So I'm going to ask the same question to Mehmet. I mean, do you think this, uh, you know, the shift in the idea of this made pipeline, which excluded actually Turkey, will relieve Turkey's sentiments of isolation and do you think this will have an impact on Turkey's Cyprus diplomacy in the coming days? What, what do you think? Um, I agree with Professor Sözen. Uh, the discovery of actual resources, hydrocarbon resources, have been quite disappointing uh, to be a major game changer, uh, not only I mean, in regional gains, but also in Cyprus. Uh, so. Uh, in early 2010s, I was saying that uh, the discovery of more hydrocarbon sources could really accelerate the sol uh, solution because the Greek Cypriots uh, were in uh, financial problems. So uh, a cooperation with Turkey would yield quick uh, income from from, uh, from the export of these resources. Uh, but the amount is not enough for that. The first one. Uh, second one is uh, the economic uh, value of these resources is becoming lower and lower, especially if the renewable sources are uh, to be used in the future more. And that's the idea in European Union policies. Only if, I mean, this is a scenario, only if in the uh, disputed areas with Turkey, uh, Turkish uh, big, really big discoveries of hydrocarbons, that could uh, bring more pressures upon Greek Cypriots to uh, to give concessions, uh, but uh, geographically uh, it doesn't seem too possible. Uh, and if the Greek Cypriots find new resources and want to use them uh, in combination with other countries or by themselves, uh, that will only create more problems, not uh, accelerating solution of the Cyprus problem. But Turkey, during this geopolitical uh, climate, uh, hydrocarbons, it's the to change these preferences, uh, at least during the current circumstances. Can I uh, just interject something which I uh, forgot to please. say if Mehmet has finished? Please. Please. please yeah, I, I think, you know, uh, again, to use um, uh, colloquial language, that train has already left the station back mm -hmm. in 2010, uh, mm -hmm. in which time there was the value if there were... Um, enough cooperation by the coastal states, um, you know, to dig it out and, and market it to international markets, that would have been possible. But given the trends, that's not the case anymore. Now, what I 
uh, failed to uh, include in my earlier analysis is that, look, if we are going to solve any problems related to Eastern and Mediterranean, this is not possible by isolating this or that country in the region. And especially uh, a country like Turkey, which is one of the biggest actor in the region with the longest shores in the Eastern Mediterranean. Um, if, if anybody thinks that uh, by establishing the East Met uh, gas form, uh, not including Turkey in it, uh, will solve all the problems, it's just a dream. So what we need here is, is genuine engagement that would require all the coastal states, all the littoral states to come around a table. And as I said, um, change the paradigm, change the discourse uh, of dealing with energy issue to more towards softer or sometimes it's called low politics issues like environment and whatnot. Uh, that could be a good beginning, but that requires, as I said, that all littoral states without any exception, should be sitting around that table. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you for all these comments. Uh, I think they were very useful. They were, uh, you know, very helpful to understand the new context. So my understanding is that this new change or is not a major paradigm shift. Of course, there is some change. And I think, uh, as I understand from all your comments, this, will st uh, st this is likely to stimulate new diplomatic efforts uh, in the coming uh, months. So I think uh, this is the optimistic side, of course, and maybe positive or negative exchange, but it is more likely to stimulate uh, you know, diplomatic efforts. Uh, so hopefully this may uh, occur then uh, our Professor Ahmed Sözen, Professor uh, Kıvanç Ulusoy and uh, Dr. Mehmet Ur uh, Ekinci. So hopefully we will continue this uh, conversation. This, will, this was very helpful to understand the new context. Uh, we will probably continue to talk about more concrete recommendations which are, uh, which are also mentioned in this talk. So thank you for all your uh, contributions.